Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ricky, welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. What's on your mind? Uh, thank you, Brian. Yes, sir. I, you know, listen to your program. I'll tell you what, you, you really discovered a huge uh, deal with the civil rights. Uh, you, know, I, you know, all these years I was trying to figure out why is the black race, you know, always uh, well, put eight, 70 to 85% are still in poverty. When you get the, uh, you know, the Japanese come over here within 10 years, they're millionaires. Of course, you could say, well, they're smarter because you said the other day their IQs are higher and they do computers or a medical field. But then what about the Indians from India? That's one of the poorest countries in the world. They come here in 10 years, they're multimillionaires. 25% of all U.S. medical doctors are from India. You know, every ethnic group that comes here, God blesses and they prosper. And, they're, you know, Mexicans come here, they start their landscape, yard business. You know, the African race has been here for 200 years, and yet, by and large, most of them are still, you know, your highest percent of your poverty is the African race in the ghettos. Well, yeah, I I wonder, Ricky, if part of that is that we've had these, you know, Daniel Moynihan talked about this in the 1960s, that our overly generous welfare program has destroyed the black family. That's where a lot of the accumulation of wealth comes from. You know, husband and wife, they get married, they stick together, they have children, they're highly motivated to provide for them. The father now has a responsibility to go out and work and provide for the needs of his wife and his children who are depending upon them. There's a little miniature civilization there that has tremendous incentives for the husband and the father in that environment to work hard to provide for people who are counting on him to come through for them. That does something good for a man to feel that there are people that need him to be out there working hard. If the government comes in and offers all of these welfare goodies and basically says to young African males, look, we don't need you in the home. Government will be there to provide for you. Government will be there to give you what you need. We'll make up for all the differences. The things that you don't supply will be there to take care of that for you. They say the same thing to young black women. And, you know, and frankly, we're seeing the same thing, Ricky, now in the white community. This isn't a, a race issue. This is a human nature issue. There are twice as many white families now that are headed by young, single, poor moms than there are black families in America. Not a lot of people talking about that, but again, it's the same corrosive impact of an overly generous welfare uh, system that robs people of initiative and self-sufficiency and self-reliance and I think impoverishes the human spirit and the human soul. All right, Ricky, listen, thank you for the call. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Our guest in our studio is... Pastor Thomas Opio from the country of uh, Kenya, all the way from Kenya to Tupelo, Mississippi. And Pastor Opio, Thomas, welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Thank you. Well, I'm very interested, Thomas. You shared with our whole staff this morning. Yes. And I thought your story, just of, of, of kind of what you went through to wind up coming to faith in Christ and then what God has done with you since you came to faith in Christ, uh, I think was just a, uh, to me, just an inspirational story, and I think it would be a tremendous encouragement to our uh, listening audience. You know, we spend a lot of time on this program talking about kind of heavy, weighty issues, and uh-huh. <laughs> sometimes it's good to just stop and and take a, take a look at God's grace in action in the life of an individual. So tell us, we've only got about seven, eight minutes, but tell us, Thomas, about your experience in growing up in Kenya and how you came to faith in Christ and then what's happened to your life since? Okay, uh, I'm Thomas Opio, uh, the senior pastor of uh, Global Empowerment Christian Center in uh, Eldoret, Kenya. I am uh, the firstborn among nine children, and uh, when I had just finished my eighth grade, my father left us and went married another wife, and so being a a 16-year-old boy without experience and education and um, the burden of the family is falling on me, I decided, no, I want to just leave this world, you know, go. If if God can take me, I will be. it will be okay with me. But I didn't die, so I decided I'm going to run away from so, home. So at that point, you actually would have welcomed the prospect of death. Yes. That's how, that's the hole that you were in at that point. Yeah, because I was disappointed and discouraged in life. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I left my home and went to the streets, uh, a, a place called Kitale, and I was in the streets. And if if you if somebody uh, uh, the, the the listener or the, the viewer has been in Africa, they understand the uh, you know how the uh, street children are in Africa. You know, sniffing glue, and uh, the environment is just uh, uh, hard for them. And you know, people are not friendly to them. So that was the life I was in for for for, for three years. 
So you were out on the streets and, and doing their version of drugs. Yes. You were at a point in your life where you had pretty well bottomed out. Even, I don't know if suicide was was an option that you thought about. Actually, that was the option I was thinking for. You were actually thinking about that. All right, well, so you're on the streets. You're living there for three years. You're involved in kind of a drug culture. What happened then? Now, uh, I remember in 1999 when I was, uh, you know, with my friends and we'd, we had come from one town to another. And in the vehicle we were in, the vehicle got an accident and two people died instantly. Then uh, at that time when people were wailing and moaning and crying, you know, God uh, spoke to me and I heard this clearly on the, my right ear, ear that I have saved you for a purpose. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I was raised in a Christian family. My grandmother and my mother were Christians, you know, Africans and especially my clan. And, you know, they believed they, they believed by them that salvation was for women and children. So men, every Sunday morning when women and children are going to church, uh, uh, men are going to, you know, to take their local brew. So I was raised in the church, but uh, I had not given totally my life to Jesus. So on that day when we got the accident, the Lord spoke to me that he has saved me for a purpose. And that speech alone, the voice alone that I had created a desire, created a thirst for God. And when I was taken to the hospital because of the accident, you know, that night it was like, I, I, you know, I'm thirsting for something that I don't know. So the following morning, uh, I, I went to a pastor after doing my confession throughout the night. The following morning, I went to a pastor and told him I want to be saved. And that's how I came to the Lord. Hmm. Yeah. And now you have come to the United States, from what I understand, to complete your work on your doctor of philosophy degree. Yes. So God brought you from those circumstances yes. on the street, mm -hmm. sniffing whatever, glue, and to a place where now you're a doctor of philosophy. Yeah. When I got saved in uh, 1999, uh, the Lord dealt with me and uh, in 2001, the Lord called me into ministry, but I was kind of uh, uh, afraid of going into ministry because I had seen my, you know, how my uh, pastors uh, back in the village were putting on, they were disparate, they were they were disappointed in life, and I didn't want to be a Christian. But God, uh, I didn't want to be a pastor, but God dealt with me in that he spoke to me, and he used to speak to me, you know, I, 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 will, I, will, I, will, I will teach you the tongue of the learned, you know, uh, you are a light to the world. And I just went in blindly and I, I'm seeing God doing something great in my life. Mm. Yeah. And the title of the name of your church, your ministry has the word empowerment in mm -hmm. it and yes. it's got the word global in it. Yes. So you've got some big dreams for mm -hmm. what you hope God will do. What are some of the things that you hope God will be able to do through this ministry that you're a part of? Actually, the name Global Empowerment Christian Center, the, the, the word global, uh, the word empowerment actually uh, wraps the vision that we have. We, uh, you know, God has put in my heart the desire to empower, not only spiritually, financially, you know, empower socially, empower uh, every, you know, every kind of empowerment that can be done, even educationally. And that's why part of the vision we have is to come up with a, a, a social set up of a children's home whereby we have a like a, a, a small villas a three bedroom houses uh, in a you know in in every town maybe like if we, if we have a land and build like 10 houses three bedroom each then six uh, the first bedroom for the boys the second bedroom for the girls and the third bedroom for the house parents who will take care of these children and it's it's not only in one center you know it's it's all over the nation and if possible in africa and uh now that is empowering them socially because uh, many uh, we have many orphanages in Africa, but most of the time these orphanages are like they, they take care of one gender, maybe uh, you, you know, you know uh, 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 boys alone or girls alone, and they still feel you know they write this blah blah you know this and that orphanages, and they still feel the, the, the children in those orphanages still feel the stigmatization. You know, they still feel, okay, we are here because we are orphans. Even though we get the food, we get the clothing, the everything, but socially we are still in need of it. And that's what the gap that God is using Global Empowerment Christian Center to, you, to, to, to bridge that gap so that they may not only feel that they have food and clothing and, and, and shelter, but they also need to have a, 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 some setup of social life. And again, um, another vision is to empower you know, the churches, through the training of the Bible, and uh, help them, you know, do what God wants uh, us to do. 
Now, let me ask you this question, Thomas. Uh, people listening to this, uh, the desire you have to provide a home for children that have been bereft of their parents for one reason or another, provide some kind of training for mm-hmm. pastors and other ministry leaders. Is is there a way that people can get more information about your ministries or a website or a place we can direct them to if they would like to help out with some of these yes. purposes you have? Yeah, we have a website. Uh, we, it is www.globalempowermentcenter.com. Global Global Empower- Empowerment Center dot com dot com yes Global Empowerment Center dot com so people may want to get more information about what you're up to and and I assume you would appreciate any kind of financial help with some of these projects if people yes. move to do that one last question before I let you go we just got about sixty seconds but you talked about the fact that in Kenya Christianity was sort of a a religion for women. Mm-hmm. You actually have something of a similar problem with the evangelical church in America. About mm-hmm. 60 to 70% of the attendees of evangelical churches are in America. It's because a lot of men look at the evangelical church in America and they see nothing there that challenges their masculinity. Mm-hmm. What do you hope to do to sort of change, to turn Christianity in Kenya into a guy's religion? Uh, first uh, first of all, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, Kenya is opening up and we are seeing people, you know, uh, one thing is that in worship, if we want to worship, uh, everybody wants to worship something higher than what, what, what they have, you know. So if we introduce men into the gospel and they understand that God is higher than their mas- masculinity, then they'll be able to understand. And that's what we are going for and trying to bring up. Our guest has been uh, Pastor Thomas Apio from the Global Empowerment Christian Center in Kenya. If you'd like to get more information about their ministry, uh, both their work with orphan children there in Kenya, as well as doing some training for pastors and spiritual leaders, you can go to globalempowermentcenter.com, globalempowermentcenter.com. Well, uh, Pastor Pio Thomas, thank you for taking time to be with us. It's great to meet you, and God bless you and your work in Kenya. Thank you so much. God bless you. We'll be right back after these messages. Stay with us. Focal Point AFR Talk. <laughs> 